Hi, my name is Michael and welcome to Today Dreamer, a podcast and YouTube channel that examines the interplay between inner work and outer work. Through conscious conversations and practical walkthroughs, we'll be exploring ideas and practices to help you find a deeper sense of clarity, develop your focus and take meaningful action. I hope you love the show. Hello, I hope that you're well. And I just wanted to welcome you to this episode of the podcast. I've been thinking a lot recently around what it, what it means to deepen our experience, our experience of our life. What does that mean? How can we deepen that experience? How can we really sink into it? Things that kind of have come to mind have been the idea of relationships, the importance of those and how to recognize them in different ways and and nurture them, take care of them. The importance of our place, the place where we're at. Part of the reason I'm recording this intro outside with the noise of planes and cars and children in the background is because it's It's part of my natural environment. And yeah, I really wanted to kind of represent that. The connection to ourselves, what that means, the connection to nature and and the, the beings around us. How do we deepen that? How do we deepen our experience? So that's going to be the topic of today's discussion. My guest is Julian Vane, who has become a friend and even kind of a a mentor for me recently. He is a regular speaker at conferences on psychedelics and occultism. He's got a interesting background in teaching and education, which he intertwines with his work at various museums. He's got decades of experience in esoteric culture and he's got a lot of historical knowledge and um, he's, a, he's a really wise guy. Getting Higher, the Manual of Psychedelic Ceremony. We're going to be talking about psychedelic ceremony in this conversation. We're also going to be talking about relationships and Julian shared some insight into the magic of, an, of imagination as well and we got into some really interesting places with this. Just wanted to give you a heads up before we get into it. If you've got a paper and pen handy for this one, it will definitely be of good use. We kind of kicked off talking about a specific plant medicine called Salvia Divinorum or Diviner's Sage, uh, which was used throughout history, uh, I believe, with the Mazatec people for divining purposes. So divination is kind of a topic that we started just to catch you guys up because there's a bit of a pre-ramble before we really, really get into the thick of things. But it is quite interesting and quite fun. And I hope that you get something out of this just as I hope that you get something out of all the episodes and that you're playing with these ideas and you're maybe even experimenting with some of the methods or techniques in your life to bring about, you know, deeper connections. So... Yeah, let's get into this conversation. Before we do, I would just like to encourage you, like always, to you know share this with a friend that might find it useful if you have, and consider subscribing if you haven't already. The episodes are available on YouTube. You can watch them anywhere. You can find a good podcast, uh, iTunes, Spotify, that kind of thing, if you prefer just to listen. And feel free to kind of chunk them out. I know they go for a while, uh, but feel free to kind of, you know, listen to 10 minutes or half an hour at a time and and come back to it you don't have to smash it out in the one go but it's definitely worth listening or watching these ones to the end because i feel like yeah there's so so many beautiful insights that really begin to come out and blossom as we get deeper into the conversations so i hope you enjoy it i hope you get something out of it and you've got my appreciation gratitude and a big smile Uh, thank you for for giving this a moment of your time and and um, thank you for being on this journey with me. 
Let's get into it. Divination very often is about externalizing the problem. So like when we, you know, because of the kind of creatures that we are, when we're wrestling stuff with stuff that's inside of us, um, in some sense, uh, it's very difficult. But by externalizing the problem, by, I don't know, writing the thing down, by putting it outside you, particularly if you put it outside you be between you and another person, a diviner or you're the diviner, and they're, the, <coughs> they're the client. By laying down the tarot cards, what's happened is that the problem is now exposed and it's laid down in some form. And I think the, the just like anything, you know, you're painting something, you like you have to step away from the painting to be able to see the painting yeah, mm. properly. Mm. So I think when, when we've got these kind of difficult problems, we have to one one of the process, it seems to me, is like a stepping away, like a movement away so that the problem is kind of now held in the hands or laid on the table or appears or is is being brought into our interpretation of what the coffee grounds are doing in in, in the uh, in the cup. And I think the second thing that happens is that in that externalizing of the problem or the thing that represents the discussion that we're going to have, what also happens is that a good a person who's good at divination, what what it triggers in them, whichever system they're familiar with, it triggers like a whole bunch of um, associations which are not primarily mediated by like conscious awareness mm. so they are exactly like you're saying they're thinking with the heart or with the gut or however you want to describe it so you're thinking the 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 process of um analyzing the data and describing it and expressing it and the, the kind of the rapport that you get into if you're doing divination for somebody else is a rapport which is like at its best it's kind of sort of deeper in a way. I, that's how it feels to me. Deeper in a way than the kind of just a conscious discussion between people about, do you think this is a good idea? I don't know. What do you think? What's the pros and the cons? Very different thing. Mm. You know, we are settling down into a more visceral way of um, engaging with the world. Mm. And that's how it seems to me. Yeah. And I think that's also interesting because there's then, there's then things that are kind of linked to that, like... Um, that two things that happen in my experience from that. The first one is that often if I'm doing divination, I don't really remember very much what I say, like it, it kind of, and there are a lot of people who do sort of mediumship or trance stuff or whatever, say this kind of thing. It's like they kind of say the thing. Equally good astrologers that I know who are really, really well versed in their trade will just pick up a chart, glance at it and go, I think this. Mm. And you can see that they're doing this kind of intuitional sort of process. Do you think, um, how do you think the, the sage helps with that though specifically oh go, you're talking about the, the salvia thing mm. um well i think that that's that's the the um what's what's happening in that kind of process is that you've got these kind of uh with any psychedelic experience you have novel neuronal connections that are being made okay salvia is is an unusual psych psychedelic uh it, it 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 doesn't work in quite the same way as a lot of the kind of you know so-called classic psychedelics but nevertheless basically what it does is it makes novel connections between things mm. and that's what happens i think in a good divination these novel connections are made occasionally a thing sort of squirts through into the, the reality of the divination which i guess if you were a parapsychologist you would call a hit so like it's a, you might kind of <clears throat> this has happened to me particularly when I've been doing lots of divination and you kind of get into the flow of it and you lay down some cards and you say to the person, blah, 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 like off the top of your head without even really thinking about it because you're just in the flow. Mm. And they go, my God, that's amazing. How did you know this? And I, I have to say, I don't know. Nobody knows, you know. Mm. It's that's like what you were saying it. before. You're not really sure how specific yeah. things work. And I think that's um, being open to the idea of not being sure about that is something else I've been kind of considering recently. Being fluid with your beliefs, but also being open to just the mystery of things, you know, because there's so many things that are such a mystery. Um, but yeah, that that's fascinating stuff. Yeah, I remember like many times my mum has, you know, had clients come back, knock on the door and they were like, you know, everything you've said has come true exactly the way you've said it. I really want to see your mum again. And it's happened countless times since I was growing up and mm -hmm. and um my mum always used to say like it she was more of this kind of a channel like she doesn't decide what to tell the people she she's kind of flips out the cards and then it comes through um yeah. so that gives yeah. me a bit more insight into that process so yeah thank you 
That's that's um that's fascinating. And and salvia hits like a certain part of the brain, doesn't it? That no other psychedelic hits. It's like this unique thing that goes on, right? So it must be quite a unique experience. It, 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 I mean, it's interesting. There's, there, there, there are, of course, you know, classically two ways of taking salvia. One of them is to um, you, you either chew, well, you chew the, you take it orally, basically. Mm. So you can either chew the uh, quids made of the leaves. So you roll up the leaves into like a little cigar shape, and you just chew, 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 chew. Mm. Ideally, you brush cheeks and stuff first to allow the kind of absorption through the mucous membrane. That's where it likes to go straight into the bloodstream. And the Mazatec people, as I understand it, take a potion of this. So they they have a they make a, a, a potion of the leaves, uh, tea I guess we call it, uh, and then uh, drink this. I suspect I don't know this, but I suspect that what they do is roll it around their mouth quite a lot before they kind of swallow the stuff, so it's being absorbed. The other way of doing it is to smoke it. Um, you know, uh, us in the sort of uh, uh, you know industrialized West, let's call it for for, for ease of reference. Um, have it created extracts of the stuff which are formidably strong um, and that's really I find that really funny because the Mazatec describes salvia as like an elusive deer in the forest you know you've got to be in the dark you've got to be in the quiet you've got to really mm. listen mm. and chewed taken orally salvia is even at quite high dose is quite um, it's quite gentle in some respects you know it's kind of like a it's kind of always reminds me of like an organic ketamine it's, it's funny how the, the method of kind of ingestion has such a part to play in, in kind of the experience. I've heard that, yeah, smoking's like the complete opposite of what you just described. And it's this really dark yeah. or can be dark and intense and full on and, and um, too much to handle and very scary. This, these are all things that I've just heard. Um, yeah. And it yeah, seems yeah, yeah. very different from this calming kind of gentle side. And that's just from taking it a different way and, and that's that's fascinating, but it I, it does make sense, right? It's 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 definitely definitely my experience, and I think that there's there's um there's a it kind of is, is instructive in a way that this substance, which is as far as I'm aware, one of the strongest by weight uh, organic uh, psychoactives psychedelics, mm. um, that this substance because it's rather hard to uh, access and because it's kind of it, it's 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 very tricksy let's call it um that our approach in our cultures was to say can we make it really strong and then smoke it like really hard in a bong mm. and the answer is yes you can but that's not actually the best way of probably it. wouldn't like, want to yeah so yeah, man, <laughs> more isn't necessarily better you know yeah. faster is necessarily better so this know? kind of this kind of leads into what I wanted to talk to you about today and, and it, it's the idea of, um, a psychedelic ceremony and the preparation into that and how, you know, that can affect your experience and the types of way so you can prepare is something that I've been kind of thinking about. And then the whole ritual aspect of it all. Um, yeah. So I just, I'm just thinking, this is such a strange thing because we just started going off the bat. And yeah. um, before we do get into that, I wanted to ask you if you would partake in a bit of a ritual that I do on the show. I usually do it at the very beginning, but um, I feel like now's a, a good time, as good as time as ever. And all it is, is a couple of deep breaths. You know, I probably could have used them a bit earlier on with all the mucking around with cables and stuff. Um, but yeah, I'm just going to invite everyone at home to join me or wherever you are and all it is it's quite simple it's as slow as you can uh three really deep breaths in and then using your kind of diaphragm and your belly and then when you get to the peak just kind of hold that for a moment and then just as slowly and gracefully kind of release and we'll do that three times at your own pace and then, um, and then we'll we'll keep moving, I guess, into things. Very good. All right. So, just close your eyes when you're ready, and, and yeah, begin when you're ready.
Okay. So, yeah. How should we step into this? I think mm. like that. I mm. think you were, we were talking about psychedelic ceremony and you said, oh, and I could see you kind of go, there's so much here. And it's like that, isn't it? You know, it's like we could start talking and we can just go into it. And that's cool sometimes. And we can meet together and go, hooray, it's great to see you. Brilliant. And we can have a party. And sometimes that's cool. And sometimes what we want to do is we want to just take a pause and then go in. And that's it. So I guess for me, ceremony is just like, you know, the difference between making a toast or ceremonially taking wine and cracking a beer with your friends. And there's nothing wrong with cracking a beer with your friends. And sometimes that's a type of ceremony. Yeah, of course. But sometimes what we need is we just need to like pause and slow and give our attention to what's happening and then enter the story. Hmm. Why? I need to do it because I spend most of my time rushing around like a headless chicken from one project to the next, meeting loads of lovely people and doing interesting things. And what I need to do and what that was really helpful for me uh, here in the morning time in uh, Devon in the British Isles was to go just chill for a moment mm -hmm. before you and Michael get to chat. Yeah. And so I find it helpful as a way of letting go of desire for attainment as a way of letting go of the need to always be thinking several steps ahead and to bring me into the presence of what's going on uh, mm. you know I, I have a suspicion that um in uh, in our well in our culture we have a thing called the default mode network you know so when we take a psychedelic that's the thing that changes the default mode network just turns down mm. the default mode network is a narrative sense of self it's this individual sense that we have when we're sitting there ruminating about the past and thinking about the future and the interesting thing about the default mode network is that it's default for us but i suspect for many other people in many other times and places and probably throughout the human, human history it's not been the default because most of the time we were with other people. Yeah, most of the time we were collectively and communally doing stuff. Occasionally we'd go off on an individual solitary vision quest, but most of the time we were hanging out with a group of about 200 odd individuals, occasionally meeting together in bigger groups at a festival. Yeah? That's how we run, ran the show for, I don't know, man, like 100,000 years at least, something like this. And um, I think that what's helpful with those processes of going into ceremony let's call it is that they're about like being present in what's actually unfolding now you know and we might have a project we might have an intention you know we know that there's stuff planned in the future when we get to like four o'clock we're going to let the fireworks off or whatever it is we're going to do but what we're aiming to do is put ourselves in the flow of the unfolding moment in that time and i think that's really healthy seem feels healthy to me you know, I can't live there all the time. I don't live there all the time. My culture is constructed a different way. Maybe in the past or the future, that will be different. But right now, I find bringing myself into this moment where I'm holding the medicine in my hands or I'm doing the ritual action and being really present in that, not thinking about what came before, not thinking about what's coming next, not self-evaluating whether or not I'm doing it right necessarily, not critiquing myself through whatever imagined position, but just as far as I'm able, being present with what's unfolding, I think that's really healthy for me. And I, I, from what I've seen from lots of other people. Yeah, it definitely, definitely feels like a healthy way to go about doing things. And, you know, this is, makes me think of this idea of and it's something I feel like a lot of people speak about but the, the connected kind of threads between uh, a ceremony of any sort but especially it seems the psychedelic one and and the way you live your life um, yeah I just I feel like that is something that is it's probably been discussed so many times and it's such an interesting topic um, I wanted to hear your thoughts on that and also um, 
maybe some thoughts on the ceremonies themselves or even the ritual or the preparations that you do throughout your life, whether it be for a psychedelic ceremony or not. Um, mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's a bit of a compound question, I guess, but. I mean, I guess for me, it's what I strive to do as far as I'm able is to um, is to bring, as far as I'm able, elements of that kind of awareness and that kind of appreciation. I mean, that's what a lot of it's about. It's about like appreciating the thing. Like when you have the when you have the glass of wine and you're like, really, wow, this is amazing, you mm. know, or whatever. Mm. Or you're smoking the weed and it's like beautiful. It's really astonishing. You're really in it. It's about appreciating it, you know. So, like, um, I'm waking up this morning. It's a beautiful day outside, you know. Um, I've got various things to do in my day. One of the things I'm definitely going to do is to step outside, do a little bit of gentle Tai Chi and just enjoy the time, you know, and be that present in that. Like, I'm going to prioritise that as a thing that's going to happen. There's loads of other stuff. But that trying to... So having, like, techniques that I can use to really appreciate and engage with the thing. So for me this morning... That will be like the techniques that I know from Tai Chi, a bit of Qigong, because I'll find that really, it will work really beautifully. It's cold outside at the moment because it's the winter time. And so I can't put my yoga mat out and do that. Stand in Tai Chi, I know a little bit of that style. I can use that, I can do it with the sun. The sun is rising, fantastic. And for me, it's about like getting rid of this division between like, uh, you know, the sacred and the mundane. Like most of my experience of hanging out with people from, um, I guess we could kind of say like, you know, entheogenically lineage cultures or cultures where spirituality, for want of better terms, occupies a different position than the way one it does in my culture. One of the things I really notice again and again and again is that it's not like in the kind of Protestant or post-Protestant um, Anglican belief systems that I grew up within or, or, or in association with my parents were massively Christian but like that was the backdrop where like religion was a thing that happened on a Sunday and there was this kind of vague notion that there was like an ethics and you kind of did good stuff and charity and whatever but the difference between like the sacred thing and the mundane thing or the secular thing I think one of the things that ceremony is aiming to do like you said about bringing it into your life is to kind of is just to blur or even sometimes to break that boundary. And so that it's not like you're necessarily wandering around all the time as though you were inside the magic circle, but it is, I hope that I can bring much of that attention and much of that way of being in the world that I have in ceremony. And that includes things like, you know, a degree of authenticity uh, in terms of my, my own behavior and, and, and relationships with people and so on. I want to bring that into every moment I can, you know, um, every moment that, that it's appropriate, suitable, whatever, you know, trying to kind of bring, bring that, bring that in. And in terms of the, I think the second part, just thinking more of the sort of getting into the, 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 the psychedelic kind of side of it and how to approach that. I was talking to someone, um, I was talking with a group of, uh, the Psychedelic Society um, here in Britain, a uh, group of students last night. And one of the dudes was saying that he was, you know, he'd been wrestling with different kind of addictions and problems and, and stuff like many of us do. And he said, I've got some acid. I'm going to, you know, me and my, my mate, we're going to do some acid around kind of uh, Christmas time. But I really want to kind of use this as a, a, a healing opportunity. What should I do? And I said, well, there's loads of different ways you could do it. One of the models, this is not the only way, but one way to, you might think about this is do, all, do, the, do a few days of preparation before the practice. Yeah, so eat good food, be in nature, don't watch too many horror movies, stop your doom scrolling on Facebook. Like eventually, don't worry, Donald Trump, it will no longer be president. Just, just chill, just have a nice, you know, be easy and kind to yourself, nourish yourself. Then go into the experience. And if you wanna take the experience and you wanna use it as a healing opportunity, one way of doing this is to have someone who's a, an experienced and trusted friend as your sitter 
And what you do is you go inside the medicine. So you don't spend your time like chatting or like watching TV or even necessarily walking around enjoying the beautiful landscape. You go inside yourself. So in that instance, the ceremony is that process of like the preparation, going inside, and then also organizing the outro. So, and what happens next? When I go and I'm finished this being inside with perhaps the eye shades and the headphones on and going through the medicine journey, what do I find in the refrigerator after that? Is it nice, nutritious, beautiful food? Or is it just like more cans of rubbish, lager or whatever? Do you know what I mean? So it's like, you that's what it is. You build- So almost like you're crafting- not you're not specifically crafting your experience, but you're you're kind of you're building in some kind of um, preparation and and ritual, and you're creating the the setting. You're 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 being mindful about all these different aspects. Yeah. Um. And you're yeah pre- moving into it prepared, and that, like we said earlier, that the process of administration is makes a big difference. You know. Yeah. And, and, and there's, there's nothing, there's, you know, I was saying to this dude um, when, I, when I was speaking to him, that there's nothing wrong in my view with like the recreational use of psychedelics. Um, the idea of recreation, the idea of feeding our souls, the idea of being able to be open to joy and particularly with the pro-social materials like, I don't know, like mescaline or like MDMA or, 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 or things. This seems like to be something, sorry to interrupt you there, but it seems to be something that like, I feel from your, from, you know, all the interactions that we've had, this, this idea that, uh, play is quite meaningful and significant, um, in our lives, not just within a psychedelic experience. And it's like this, um, you know, a very important element. Can you tell me more about that specifically? Yeah, 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 totally. Because, because if you think about it, play is the fundamental strategy for learning. So my academic background is in teaching and learning theory. Okay. So I'm really interested in how people learn, uh, myself included. Mm. Uh, and you learn more when you're having fun. And, and you learn more when you're having fun, right? Like this, was, this has been known for hundreds and hundreds of years. You know, there's, um, uh, there, there, are, there are educationalists writing the medieval, the late medieval kind of saying, oh, it seems that people learn better when they're having fun. That's great. So um, play, playing is really important. And play also implies um, a... Uh, a joyful activity that is not focused around an output or an outcome, right? So if I give you some clay or some Play-Doh, some modeling materials, and if you're like five or if you're 90, it doesn't matter. I don't even have to give you any instructions necessarily. Mm-hmm. You'll just sit there and like, oh yeah, yeah, I'm just messing. And you're not necessarily, I'm not asking you to make a thing. I'm not asking you to create me a pot. In fact, what happens, and I've taught older people as well as kind of younger people, as we get older, we become more, uh, we can, if we're not careful, we can become more kind of um, uh, brittle, yeah, and more kind of boxed in. Uh, and like a Taoist, you know, I sp- aspire to the flexibility of a, of a young person and the wisdom of the sage. And you go to, you give someone, I used to teach computers to older people, right? And one of the things that they'd say to me is, can you give me a list of what I should do? And I would say, no, that is simply not possible. I can give you a few bits of information about like how to start the thing up, how to get online, blah, blah, blah. But ultimately what I had to do was I had to work with them to rekindle their ability to play. Because in our culture, what we tend to do, less so in some settings these days, is to bash this out of people by getting them to memorize stuff, by getting them to be focused around the output or the outcome of what they're doing. It doesn't matter whether or not you like reading the text, it's this is what we've had for the exam. Like what, really? It doesn't matter whether I like it, it's what we're doing for this pros. What the hell? You really curated an educational setting that's like this? where the fundamental process that we have is playful. I remember with my children, you know, when they were really little, the, one of the delightful games that you get when you f- make first contact with that new consciousness and you stick your tongue out at them and go, and then they do the same to you and then you do it back. Yeah. There's no purpose for that. You could argue, oh, well, this is, you know, this is an evolutionarily conserved process in order to allow parent, parent-child bonding and the development of language. Well, yeah, that's, that's one way of looking at it but also in and of itself, it's purely playful. And so that's why, yeah, you're totally right, man. I mean, 
I like ceremony. I like dressing up in my kind of strange robe and comedy hat with feathers on and stuff and doing those kind of things and kind of pushing the envelope in terms of practice. But I'm very, very, uh, and I like the idea that people who are involved in the medical profession will get to use these substances are increasingly getting to use things like psychedelics. That's great. But it's critical that we are able to play with them, to have joy from them, to find, and we, we, we do this remarkably well, considering that we're in a prohibitionist world by and mm. large. Mm. People play with these, you know, illegal, massively criminalized substances by and large, actually relatively safely and actually relatively humanely, you know, in relation to each other. Mm. That's, so a, that's an change. interesting point. Yeah. I've got. So if we can change the context, we could do it so even better. It'd be amazing. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I've got this. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree with you. I totally agree with you. There's definitely this this thing that happens when we're when we're children. You know, we've got this sense of curiosity about the world. We've got this sense of kind of play, like you said, and this imagination, this creativity that runs wild. And then as we get older, it seems like, um, you know, it just seems to kind of disappear in 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 some of us in 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 different you know, probably in most of us in different ways. Um, but then reconnecting to that childlike kind of essence, I think it can be a powerful thing. I'm just thinking about it from like my creative background. I used to think of ideas for ad agencies and we used to get in a room and have to kind of work this muscle of creativity and come up with different ideas. And it was mm. really, it seemed to me a process of reconnecting to my inner child in a way, reconnecting to this sense of curiosity and play and, and going out there. And, and now that I think about it, I mean, there's, there's, there's some things in, within creativity that have a lot to do with, um, like, I'm just thinking of this, this, the process of coming up with an idea and you kind of focus on, on, you know, all the reference material for a while, and then you walk away and you do something completely different and you yeah. step away from that for a little bit. Um, so it's, it's leading me down the track of kind of thinking about something we've, we've spoken about an, a different time, this idea of kind of having an intention and moving into uh, what you're doing with a certain intention and then focusing in on something and then kind of letting it sit in the back of your mind or wherever it sits and, and allowing another process to take place. But I'm jumping around quite a bit here. Um, no, I mean, that's really nice though, because doesn't that, rem it reminds me, I, I, I don't know if it reminds you, but it reminds me of what we were speaking about in terms of the divination process. So you have like all the information, you have all the kind of the, uh, the, the yeah. assemblage, of, like the coffee grounds or the, the, the natal chart or whatever, you kind of step away from it and then you allow this, you allow, and that's a really interesting thing, isn't it? It feels to me, I don't know about you, but it feels to me like I allow these things to come up from from the unconscious i like it's not like yeah, you're I'm, not doing I'm, it it's I'm, like you're not do yeah what, Lama. you're just sitting there yeah, yeah. and you're the, sort of like a channel like we yeah, said before the about the, go, look at this thing yeah Whoa. yeah do you have any techniques for maybe um facilitating that kind of an experience or or deepening that experience within a psychedelic context i think one of them is actually to play so that's why the thing about recreational, you know, quotes, recreational use is important, is that one of the delightful things you can do in a psychedelic state, particularly if you've got one that's going to last a little while, you know, you've mm. eaten some Sam or you've taken some LSD, is get yourself some stuff to play with. And it can be like anything from like a sport thing, like a ball to kick around or a frisbee to throw. It can be painting, paint and art materials. It can be clay. It can be like you know, body adornment, whatever it happens to be. It could be like comedy dressing up with your friends and putting on mm. silly hats and funny voices. Mm. That's a really, really valuable thing to do. Like stuff that doesn't, at least ostensibly doesn't have an out, necessarily have an outcome. Certainly doesn't have an intention to have an outcome necessarily, mm. but it will, it will spiral out into really interesting stuff if it's done in a good, a good way and held in a good space. So I think have, have materials on hand and, and situations on hand that will allow you to play, mm. will allow you to have, um, you know, art materials is the classic one. It's there's, 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 there are many, many delightful things to be done. If you're tripping at the beach, for instance, yeah. you know, and you've got access to like the stand and found materials and you can build. I remember, I remember talking to a guy 
um, I can't remember who it was there, it might have even been James Gesso, so some, someone somewhere down the line who, was, who had gone out with a group of their mates um, and ended up sort of creating this kind of ritual altar kind of, kind of situation. I think I've spoken to several people who've done this. And they kind of didn't know they were doing it until they'd finished doing it, mm. you know, mm. and they ended up with this sort of, oh, guys, we've made this big artwork, which is also like symbolic of a whole bunch of stuff that we're bringing to this experience. And it also has a lot of meaning that we mm. can interpret. And it doesn't last, last forever. It's impermanent imperman- and it, there's this kind and, of... And, it's, and, it, yeah. and it assembles itself. Yeah, know? yeah. Um, that's, that's the interesting thing. This process of getting out, getting out of the way, I think... That's part of the reason for me that I like to really remind myself that I don't know shit, man. I mean, I'm just, I'm in just, I'm just like a, like another bag of mostly water frambling around on the Western spiral arm of the galaxy, like everybody else, you know, I've got experiences that to draw on and I've got like some suggestions of the things that the world, the way that things seems to me, but part of my practice is to just not be that, that ossified older person who's kind of can't forget has forgotten how to loosen the girders of their yeah. soul and just be very light touch with this. Like I do, I do rituals, I do spells to get things done. And sometimes those things get done. And in that activity, I have, I always remind myself that I have no way of proving any of this. I have no way of like rerunning the experiment and I am still fundamentally just a, like a little pink bag of mostly water wandering around in Devon on a little island archipelago off mainland Europe in the 21st century, whatever. Because, because that actually is the best technique. Get out of the way, let the stuff happen. Yeah, you've got, there's so many, there's so much to play with here, uh, Julian. So I think like, um, there's, I want to come back to definitely, I want to come back to a few things, but um this idea of presence coming back to kind of where we began as well seems to be a common thread in um, in a couple of different areas. You know, you, we mentioned play and that links to the idea of sport. Um, and I've been kind of tuning into some of uh, Rupert Sheldrake's stuff around um, different ways to come into presence. I think he talks about things like prayer quite a bit. Um, mm-hmm. ritual, which we've touched on and, and meditation that kind of, um, of course, yoga, um, like body work, like things that you've mentioned, like Tai Chi, um, and, and this idea of festivals he mentioned, mentions as well, uh, this idea of, you know, having people together and, and feeling that presence, like, I guess, like you, um, like you mentioned, like we're used to, like we used to for a long period of time, mm-hmm. um, so this idea of presence is seems to be linked to the feeling you have in 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 it when you're kind of surrounded or absorbed in a in a psychedelic state or experience, and there seems to be some kind of a link between that. And I really like the idea of experimenting. This is kind of what excites me: experimenting with prayer in ceremony or even building the ceremony with these different elements incorporated. So you've got, you know, you've prepared enough to have a sense of play at a certain part. There's, there's been an intention made and there's been space created for that specifically. Um, the idea of, you know, like the rituals, um, some kind of body work and, or breath work and, 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 um, really bringing this presence together with the ceremony because they seem so, they seem like they would go, like they're, they're really made for each other and that's kind of part of the whole thing. And then what can you draw from that back into life? And yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I, I think that the, those, the, that sequence or that, that um, set of um, processes that uh, Rupert's identifying there, m- most of the, particularly some of the kind of the larger scale rituals or, or, or ceremonies that I've, been involved with or or helped helped curate or, or, or run myself that's what you aim to do like you'll often do something like say okay like I don't know for the first bit we're going to sit in silence for 20 minutes and just do mindfulness of breath and then we will say some prayers and some intentions to the spirit of the time the spirit of the place the spirit of the medicine the spirit of the directions whatever then what we're going to do is we're going to go into some process where we have where we can become uh, deeply present in our bodies because we're going to be doing some moving maybe there'll be some music something like this then what we're going to do is we're going to go quiet and inward then what we're going to do is we're going to kind of share some 
uh, some some opportunity to be kind of playful together. We're going to make collective music or we're going to mm. sing together. And then we're going to go out from there and we're going to have like a massive party. While the sing. whole time, the whole time yeah. you're in the presence and if anything comes up, you're going into that kind of as yeah. you've got this kind of loose structure. Yeah. Yeah. So you, so you, so most, uh, you know, a lot of ceremonies will, will have that kind of those elements somewhere will appear within them, depending on the mm. type of the style of the group, you know, the lineage of the group, the, uh, the medicine or the practices being used. I'm, I'm, I'm picturing these, I'm picturing chanting with a group in some real prehistoric place and, and having like, I don't know, have you seen that, that. Um, documentary Baraka, I think it's called Baraka yeah. or Samsara, yeah. and they've got these yeah. guys, and they're in this kind of pit, and they're all like making these like deep vocalizations. Imagine something like that. Um, you you know, imagine our ancestors in the in in in, well, in many places, but from you know where I am, the uh, in 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 France and in Spain, there are caves that were um, that where people lived in the Ice Age. And uh, there's also, I believe now, evidence of like uh, people from um, uh, the, the lineage that blended with us, so the Neanderthal people, uh, using uh, objects to hit stalactites and stalactites within the cave, right? So they were making uh. like a lithophone, using like they were playing the stones. And in these places, you would sing, right? Now we know also winding on several thousands years later we get to things like chamber tombs so there's a big chamber tomb near a place called silbury hill west kennet long barrow very very amazing i don't know how old is that it is. like the old. egyptian thing because i've it's heard like about a, that it's like a, okay so if you imagine like a, a structure which has some really big stones at the entrance like either side of a main entrance and then it's basically a tunnel which has been covered made of stone and then covered with earth Right. So this is like a chamber tomb. It has a long gallery down to a, a space at the end and it has smaller little areas mm. off each side. Mm. And these places were used just like a cathedral. They were used for many things. Some of them were burial sites. But just because a cathedral is a burial site doesn't mean it's not an active religious site as well. And there's really interesting work. One of the people to look at is a guy called uh, Paul Devereaux, who did lots of kind of research about um, this field which he was one of the people involved in really kind of opening up called acoustic archaeology, where essentially you go to these places and you do stuff like you sing or you play drums, you use the kind of sounds that were, were available to people at the time. And you find that they're designed to create kind of weird standing waves and really weird kind of like, you know, you, someone is speaking in one part of the tomb and it sounds like it's coming from somewhere else. You know, these kind of parabolic reflections of the sound really amazing and this is deliberately done it would seem so human beings of you know music goes with with a uh, ritual with uh, psychedelics with altering consciousness in a big big way mm -hmm. and we've been playing with this really subtly really cleverly really intelligently for a very long time mm. that's fascinating stuff have you been to one of these places before in your like have you yeah man i've done i've done psychedelic rituals in these places yeah of course they're only, they're, only, they're only up the road. Well, you know, more or less. All right. We're definitely going to talk about this more um, off, off podcast, I think, because this is fascinating stuff. Um, so I wanted to, yeah, just change gears pretty radically and um, start talking about uh, relationships because I'm, I'm, mm. I'm cognizant of time and I feel as though it's something that I wanted to dive a little bit deeper with you on. So I'm just going to kind of, yeah, shift gears a little bit and ask you about, you know, what you see the uh, meaning behind relationships is and how significant you see that in our lives. Because I feel like it's, it seems like the most significant thing. And it seems like when you, I'm just linking this to ceremony again, when you kind of do something like you prepare for a ceremony, you mention a lot of times um, you know, when we have had conversations or I think you even wrote this in, in one of your books, um, getting higher, you mentioned this idea of kind of speaking to the medicine or the drug or the psychedelic, what do you, whatever you want to call it, um, mm. in a, in a sense, that's, um, like it's a person, like you're, like you're, you have some kind of a relationship with 
um, that that spirit. And I'm just thinking of the idea of walking through life, having relationships with, like the more relationships you have, the, the more they seem to bring out in us, different parts of us. And I kind of wanted to see, yeah, what your take on relationships was. And, and um, yeah, I think I'll leave it at that. I think that question makes sense. Yeah, yeah, man, it makes total sense. It makes total sense. I, I guess for me, um, you know, people talk about the great work of magic, you know, this terribly exciting thing. What does what on earth does this mean? This transcendental experience of, um, I don't know, whatever it's supposed to be. Mm. Um, and I think that the, the, the territory for much of our, let's call it spiritual work, magical work, whatever, is the territory of interpersonal relationships, right? Because we're like a hominid, we're a monkey thing, we're an ape. And what matters to us is other people. Like if we don't get if we don't get held and cuddled and hugged when we're little, we die. Like we literally just die. Mm. And if we don't get people speaking to us and communicating with us successfully before we become like early teenagers, we don't acquire language, you know, we can't become in some respects uh from the certainly from that perspective a kind of a fully embraced member of the human family and however difficult things might be between us with our partners with our enemies with the people that we uh that who've just double parked across the street or we've been having a row however difficult those things are we are still all these creatures these apparently to some degree self-aware self-narrativizing complicated technology tool using beings occupying the same space and so because of that like the great work of magic for me the transformative power of whatever practices we're doing and however we frame them you know whatever envelope they're happening they must have a relevance to our relationships with other people and that's not to say that people can't like go off and become like you know hermits or spend time on solitary retreats yeah that's a thing but that's still actually in relation to other people the, the relationship is that you're not with them yeah it's still a relationship and fundamentally that person who's gone off on their retreat still had to have a caregiver however good bad or indifferent to allow them to grow to the point where they could go off on their solitary vision so it's got to be about like relationship. It's got to be about finding our way through this very, very difficult territory because we have biological systems and we have like uh, processes within us where which are which are difficult. You know, everything from within like uh, domains of territory, sexuality, you know, resource, uh, the you know the 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 necessity and ability to lie. All of these things are really complicated, and that's the most survival. And, yeah, all of that. Yeah, the the bit in our the, the structures in our brains that are the biggest by both virtue of the number of neuronal connections and actually just by weight, are the structures which are about processing interpersonal relationship. Right, we are basically we are we are entities designed to make sense of the other person who's saying stuff and like. Are they a friend? Are they a threat? How does this change? How do I feel? What's going on? All of that behavior, all of that, um, you know, uh, rapport that builds up and my like intuition and sense of what's happening within a social sphere, that's the bit that's the most complicated and difficult for our brains to deal with. And so we have the biggest bit of our brain assigned to that process. And so we can we can also then utilize that in other contexts. So when we come to the medicine and we hold it in our hands, we address it like a person because it is a person. It's just a person shaped like a bunch of mushrooms, you know, and we we speak to it in that way because we're, we're, we're able to use more of the processing power and more, and more of the strategies that we have to deal with that. It's like leaning into our strengths almost. And then, yeah, man, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. That. That's a beautiful way. Of like the it. natural, our we, natural way of being. Mm. Yeah. And then when we go to the vision, very often what happens is if there's a part of ourselves or a part of like some interdimensional reality, who knows what it is, that needs to communicate something to us, it will usually appear as, a, as an entity. Yeah, and the entity might be an abstract blobby thing with lights on it, or very often if it's like ayahuasca or something like this. You hear about that quite often, look, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It will look like a, you know, a vertically symmetrical thing with eyes and it will come up and it will say some stuff 
and you'll go through a process and you know you learn something hopefully from from that experience yeah so so our brain when it needs to communicate back to our own awareness even our brain does this you know or or, or if you like to put it in a more animist uh, a more spiritist way when the spirits appear through the ether through the other universe they look at the human brain and they say right what have i got in here to build myself a body out of right well this monkey responds well to faces so i better have a face right i've got a face right this monkey responds very well to things that are um it's going to really notice something that looks like a snake because it's got a bit in its biology designed to notice snakes or even like so the I'm, hear the frequency of a baby crying yeah it, exactly or so so it's almost like the spirit kind of like it's got it's got this palette that's like you know julian's brain or michael's brain and what's in here well it's got okay so we've got access to like the sound of a baby crying right they're really going to notice that uh something with eyes on it they're really going to notice that it's something interesting you're making yeah, me think of how different different um animals see the world through the different senses and how different it is to our own and how we never it's very hard to even contemplate that like um, you imagine what it must be like if you were a dog and you were tripping right so would you for example have would scent be one of the kind of mm -hmm. uh what would that be like like to have yeah. psycho there's very few psychedelics that really really significantly affect smell um but wouldn't it be fascinating wouldn't it be great wouldn't it, i mean perhaps uh maybe when you know if 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 a dog were to take lsd perhaps it would end up with these kind of synesthesia between scent and and sight mm. or scent and hearing or something in the same way that we often get it between hearing and vision you know because those are our main modalities um yeah, there's a really good, uh, um, I think I mentioned this in conversation last night as well, there's a guy called Giorgio Samarini who wrote a brilliant book which is about animal animals, that is to say non-human animals, taking psychoactive. I think I've heard about this. Yeah, like different stories uh, and stuff or something like that. Yeah, he's got he's, he's really worth checking out his work. He's got some really, really good papers of various things, you know, archaeology and history and blah, blah, blah. But um, And some really, really nice work. The work on animals is, is about, you know, it's also nice because it contextualizes the human desire to change awareness by going, well, actually, look, all these other animals, all these other creatures do this as well. Like, you know, there are insects that seek out types of mushroom in order to go and get stoned. I mean, it's, you know, it's a thing. Mm. It's a thing biology mm. does. Yeah. And I, it's funny because I've seen a lot of pictures just talk, bringing it back to the cactus. Like with, with the cacti, there's a lot of animals that are drawn to it naturally. You see, it. I've seen a lot of photos of, you know, different animals whether it's spiders or frogs or um butterflies or you know bees and and different birds they're just the kookaburra like saw one the other day they just love being around the cactus it's yeah it's it's an interesting thing and i guess that maybe just to fold it back to the conversation about relationship as well it's mm. like that the world is made from you know the world is made from relationship we only understand things through relationship i can only measure the position of something in relation to some other stuff you know the position of my hand in relation to that wall and this wall here you know um i look at the cactus and i remark on the fact that it has a relationship with these animals mm. like it's that's territory that's the fundamental territory you know that we have to work with and that that's that's rewarding and beautiful and tragic and difficult and heart-rending and all of those kinds of things and that's where i guess the work is you know certainly yeah. it seems to me that that's where the work is you know politically socially as a species like that's where we need to do the work yeah the idea of community and the strength in that and how you know how beautiful that is the times i've have been lucky enough to experience it so idea of humans to working together or coming together with each other, you know, it's a, uh, yeah, it seems to be, <laughs> it seems to be something important. <laughs> yeah. look, look at festival, right? Look at festival. So we know talking about uh, Silbury Hill and uh, West Kent at Long Barrow, not far away. Uh, you've got things like um, Salisbury Plain, Stonehenge, all of that jazz, right? Mm, mm. You've got Avery, Stone Circle. You've got these massive structures. You've got things from other cultures, cultures and settings. You know, the Gopeli Tepe in uh, in Turkey is probably one of the most interesting because that was built um, 
pretty much before humans were really bothering seriously with what we now describe as agriculture. So human beings, probably in pretty much all settings, have lived in relatively small groups of probably around 200 individuals for most of their lives. And then periodically, often once or twice a year, they'll get together in big groups and they'll do all the stuff that humans do. In the tribes groups. meet so, up. Yeah, the tribes meet up. That would it's be no fun. Like, that they would be the fun, we, fun experiences where know. a lot of play takes place, I'm sure. We can be totally sure, archaeologically, that that's what happened around the, the site of um, the sacred landscape of Wiltshire, which the Stonehenge monument is is a, a later. Oh, that's fascinating. Uh, mm. There's it's the site, signs of big parties, man. There's like animals that have been slaughtered for food. There's like fires in different places. There's like this is what this is. People gather together. You think of just the biology. You need to have people outside of your immediate community to have relationships and have sex with and have babies with. Otherwise, you're going to really have problems. Do you feel like right? there's so, some link between why we I keep cutting you off? But this is so interesting. Like this this idea of the fire and why we love as a species kind of getting together around a fire. It's a fundamental thing. It's a fundamental gathering point, isn't it? Like there's um. <laughs> a little while ago, um, uh, I was uh, running a retreat with with my partner Nikki Weird, and we wanted a bit in the in the the weekend where we all came together around a fire, mm. and we thought, "What's that called? Like when you go together around a fire? Like has it got a word for that? What's that process called?" And so we 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 kind of did a little bit of research, and the Anglo-Saxon word for gathering around a fire is thing. T H I N G thing. So it's a thing, right? <laughs> in uh, in in uh, um, Iceland, the 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 parliament of all the people on the island is called the Alf thing, right? So the all thing. So the thing, the thing, the word thing, the English word thing means essentially a gathering around the fire. Yeah. So a word that is so like, how can this word mean something specific? It's such a ubiquitous word because that experience of gathering around the fire is utterly ubiquitous through all cultures and all settings. And we've done it for, I mean, humans have had fire. Well, all the time we've been homo sapiens, we've had fire. Uh, and probably we've had fire for like maybe half a million years, maybe even as long as a million years, we've been able to make and use fire. That's interesting. That's so long. That's so long that the reason that you and I can walk upright is because we, our ancestors learned to metabolize their food by cooking it, right? We can cook vegetables, which means we don't have to have several stomachs and a massively long intestine. We can cook all kinds of stuff, all kinds of things, all kinds of different foods from psychoactive and psychedelic foods through to things that would be completely inedible were we not able to process them through what is an external belly. And this external belly allows all these other things to flow from it. You know, all of, the, all of our technology, you know, it comes from fire. The only thing that I can see that humans do that's unique in the, uh, the world of animals is the make, making and use of fire. Uh, and that's, like I said, it's before even humans. You know, our ancestors, our Neanderthal ancestors were doing this stuff as well. Um, everything else that we do, communication, territory, tool use, all of that stuff, we do a very elaborate version of it, sure, but loads of other creatures I can point to do it. Not many of them make and use fire in the way that we do. Seems to me there's this like, um, if you just, if we just kind of come back to this idea of a child and the mind of a child and, and the curiosity and play and the sense of creativity that is naturally a part of all of us that seems to get lost along the way. If you look at that, the, the idea of a child growing up um, and kind of the life cycle of a human, but then look at that life cycle, you know, in terms of our species, um, it's almost, it seems as if, you know, going back to our roots or going back to, a, uh, if you want to call it a childlike sense of play, but, but what I mean is um, how we were back in the day um, in some sense, you know, you know, maybe learning from that in, in some way, stepping out of our own way, could be a beneficial thing. This idea of tribes, community, um, presence, nature, fires, you know. Um, yeah, that's kind of what comes to mind for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I hear that. And I think that that's... Not, to, like, um, not to say that, you know, there aren't some, you know, amazing things that we need to kind of celebrate. 
in in the way that we live now mm. i mean i really like the fact that it's unlikely i'll die of smallpox or impacted molars mm. i like that i think that's very good um i um i can see that there are issues with you know humans reproducing in prodigious number and that's a thing but um i i there's there are many things about our cultures uh over the course of the last i don't know 10,000 years let's say since we started building chapel hulk in in turkey and that you know let's are you know arbitrarily take it from there there's some good stuff yeah there's some, definitely some good stuff and i think that many people uh now are living in a time where we are um awake to things like the importance of connecting with nature and sitting around a fire we are awake to the importance of playful activity and whether or not we see this as being um recuperated by capitalism by saying oh, actually we, we want creative people as well as productive people we, we want to kind of you know i've worked as a graphic designer as well yeah so i mean i've seen like the mining of ideas but hey that's that's a thing and it's you know, trade has always kind of gone on. Perhaps the issue is whether or not we see that as being the most valued activity in our culture. Yeah, perhaps that's the issue. Not so much money or any of that stuff. It's just like, well, what do we consider to be the most important uh, uh, elements of what's going on here? But, you know, if I, I guess look, I'm like I'm 52. Yeah. So I look it's very uh, even in the brief period that I've been around, um, I have seen changes in culture to acknowledge the importance of those things not that there weren't groups of people who were appreciative of the importance of you know connecting with nature play all of these kinds of things before that time but i think that there's um there's a much more flu i i live in a much more fluid world and the people that i speak to the younger people that i speak to live it seems to me in a much more fluid world than the world that i grew up in and I like that, yeah, I like that a lot. Like I was born in 1968 and the year before I was born, male homosexuality was decriminalized in Britain, right? 1967, it became permitted in England and Wales for uh, consenting men over the age of 21 in private to have sex. And that's like, whoa, if I talk to my children who are in their teens about like, sexuality sexual identity any of these kind of issues they're like yeah well whatever like if people are just being nice to each other and they're not harming anyone then like who cares it could be like an asexual person people in a polyamorous you know multiple relationship people who are kind of queer identified but then when the transition they don't care they genuinely don't care you know and okay there are other people of different opinions and that's by no means like the, a, 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 a view that appears throughout all settings in the globe but it's a lot more common in the culture that i occupy now than it was back in the day when i was a kid growing up mm. when i was born into the year after male homosexuality was was made finally legal do you know what i mean it's like it's a huge change you know and so i guess what i'm saying is i'm hopeful michael may I'm, I'm 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 an optimist you know i've got kids you know both have so let's you know you've got to be a bit optimistic on these things everything's going to be okay and everything already is okay um yeah yeah so this this brings this idea um brings me to a, a one more point that i really wanted to make sure i touched on with you um and it was this idea of i'm um, this is just a curious thought and a question but um, you, you're kind of speaking about these phases that you've been through um, in your experience here. And um, I'm sure that since there's a parallel between psychedelic experience and life, it goes the other way as well. And I'd like to know, you know, some of the phases that you've been through uh, since your since your initial experience uh, with psychedelics and, and what that kind of that journey or that that um, shifting, ever shifting, impermanent story has looked like. I mean, I guess it, it, there's several registers I could answer that in. I suppose one of them is just the pragmatic thing of like when I was a, when I first became interested in magic and the occult and so on, I got involved in Wicca. And in Wicca, although um, there is as part of the tradition, the use of, uh, of of cannabis is certainly mentioned and other consciousness changing substances. It, it's not a big thing. It wasn't a big thing within the community that I was in. You know, people smoke weed. People would talk about their stories of taking acid in the in the 60s and 70s, but it wasn't part of the, the thing. Mm. And then um, 
I finally got my hands. In fact, I was given some LSD uh, by somebody. And uh, I, then I made a, a youthful error, which is um, it's recounted in a couple of things. I think it's in, in The Fool in the Mirror, uh, the story, I, I tell the story. But basically, the long and the short of it is that some dude gave me what I thought were two trips. And so I ate half of one and then I ate another half of one and then nothing happened. So I ate the other, the other whole one. And then I realized that they were actually like blotters that only made sense if there were four of them. Yeah. So I'd like eaten eight trips. And um, so I was very grateful that I'd done like before that, you know, this, I was in my early 20s. I'd done already maybe 10 years of like meditation practice and blah, blah, blah. And I kind of got through this experience of like, wow, this is amazing. Really interesting. And then it's only really been since the kind of my late 20s that I've been gradually bringing uh, psychedelics into my ritual practice yeah so I didn't start off with this at all I started off with like the western mystical tradition in the form of wicca and ceremonial magic um and I guess part of the reason for me doing that was that in the western uh, esoteric tradition you've got like people like Crowley you know being like the exciting bad boy taking loads of drugs and like having loads of sex and stuff and then you've got the kind of the more sort of restrained kind of Dion Fortune style of kind of ceremonial practice. And there was like, in my head, as well as within the tradition, there was this kind of sort of tension between these things. And it wasn't that I was opposed to the idea of uh, making use of drugs, but I could see how, um, I could see how having, I guess it's a little bit like maybe the, the, the example people give with P Picasso, like learning the rules of perspective was really helpful before then starting to do to break those rules and to go into other spaces yep. particularly because i don't come from a lineage or i didn't now i'm increasingly realizing actually particularly from things like um uh chris bennett's work in lee before 20 and and my own kind of research that, I, that actually the western mathematical magical tradition does have a lineage with with psychoactives but i wasn't i wasn't kind of connected i didn't really see that i had to go out to other cultures to north or south america to india and so on to engage with those ideas, to then kind of come back to them. I guess in the same way that, um, you know, like European culture, what happened was that we we had to be reminded that by, by Maria Sabina and that story with the Wassons, that actually the medicine grew here all the time, you know? So my own story with it, I guess, is like initially I started off doing ceremonial kind of practice then I had like a very strong psychedelic experience. And then I gradually brought psychedelics into my practice, informed by all these traditions that were kind of outside where I lived. And then as I learned about them, I started realizing that they were actually already on my doorstep. I just hadn't noticed them, you know? Um, and then in doing that, then the guess, I guess the last like maybe 15 years or so have been really exploring that territory and also exploring like how do we how do we create ceremony that might be suitable for substances for which there is no lineage so novel substances you know um uh whether it's something like um uh ketamine, ketamine or, yeah. or, or synthetic 5 meo dmt or like you know any of these kind of weird collections of letters and numbers mm. basically like how can we how can we use these medicines in a good way and so that's one of the things that I've been doing over that time. Mm. Um, but most of my practice doesn't look like banging a big load of psychedelics in my head and then doing rituals. It looks like the Tai Chi and the Qigong that I'm going to do later on this morning. That's what most of it looks like. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's fascinating. Mm. Also, I wanted to... It's probably something you speak about quite a lot. Um, and you kind of glazed over it in when you spoke about your, your background. Um, and yeah, I like wanted to dive a little bit deeper and I'm, I am conscious of time and I know that you do want to get to that Tai Chi probably fairly soon because it's such a nice place to reconnect to that sense of stillness and presence. But, um, yeah, I want to talk about magic and talk about this idea of, um, from what I understand, um, playing with the imagination and the lines between the imagination and, you know, everything that is. 
and like kind of where that line is and, and, um, what, you know, what we can do with our imagination and coming again, it comes back to another, another one of those childlike, um, qualities, I guess, you know, means we might have to touch on curiosity as well, but, um, uh-huh. this idea of imagination and magic, would you be able to just maybe share some thoughts on that? Cause I couldn't think of anyone better to ask. And it, it is something that, um, you know, I've noticed is actually beginning to be talked about more and more in a lot of different ways, because it's referring to, you know, you know, for so long, this idea of magic has been this, or for a lot of people make belief and, um, kind of, they've even made sounds for it. Hoo, hoo, ha, ha, woo, hoo, whatever. Um, yeah, yeah. so yeah, I, I feel like there's a little bit more to it than that. And I'd like you to just share those, you know, links between imagination and, and magic and, um, anything else in that area you feel like sharing if you could. Yeah, man. Very, there's that thing, isn't there, where like there are at least as many definitions of magic as there are occultists, probably um, yeah. more, because they change their minds. But the one definition that I like, <laughs> uh, that, that I often use, is that magic is the technology of the imagination. So the easiest way of thinking about this for us Westerners, uh, let's call us from, in this context, is that um, we believe in a thing called psychology, mm-hmm. right? So firstly, we believe in a thing called psychology. Um, it is arguably sort of provable in variety of senses that it has meaningful like data inside it, this, this envelope of a thing called psychology. So let's imagine that what we're doing is we want to create a spell to help us um, acquire money. So one of the things that we might want to do with this spell to acquire money uh, it's always good to talk about things in terms of money, money, death or sex is what, where the Taoists did a lot of their teaching. So money, I want to get money. So one of the ways of getting money is to get a job. And so one of the ways to get a job is to make a really good impression of the interview. So what I do is before I go into the interview, I stand there with my feet just slightly more than shoulder width apart, my uh, hands on my hips. And I imagine myself in some way to be this um, calm, authoritative intelligent, engaging, um, assertive as I need to be, but also curious and, you know, all the qualities that I want. And I imagine myself being strong in these feelings. Yeah. So I'm, I'm putting myself into a physical posture. I'm modifying my breath and I'm imagining stuff. So what I'm doing is I'm using what the Buddhists might call skillful means. I'm using a technique, a repertoire of technique, changing my breath. Like we did at the beginning of this. Seems like the idea of skill is quite important. Yeah, 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 yeah. You've got to have, like, I'm really, that's why I'm interested in, like, the whole chaos magic thing, because it, like, it prioritizes, like, look, you can tell me the funny names that you call this stuff, and you can tell me the the the, the, the bija mantras or the, um, the, the names of the deities or whatever, but I want to know, like, what is it I have to do? What's the tech here? What's the, like, do I have to stand up? Do I have to, you know, do I have to, like, put my hands on my head? What am I doing, you know, and what am I imagining while I'm doing these things? So to take something like the desire to acquire money and to break that down into a series of achievable goals, and we would call this psychology. Psychology is a daughter science to magic in the same way that chemistry is a daughter science to alchemy. And so we put ourselves in these positions. We use our imaginative capacity. We know our imagination can be fooled. That's definitely true. But if we actively use that fact, we can use that in a way that's empowering for ourselves and others. The placebo effect is the most obvious example of this. Someone can give me uh, placebo, you know, placebo ibuprofen is, uh, sorry, placebo morphine is stronger than real ibuprofen, right? In terms of most people's response to it. So if you give someone, you say to them, "This this is opiate, right? This is like an opiate which will kill your pain. And you do this in the right context and the person is able to engage with that that medicine that you give them, even though it might be an inactive tablet of something, you know, it's just chalk, 
that will be stronger than actually giving them real ibuprofen. Right? Yeah, this is so, all documented stuff. This is like a real. How interesting yeah, well, is the placebo effect, though, when you actually think about it? It's, it's really. I tell you, there's a couple of papers that have come out recently about it, which suggests that it's getting stronger as well. And that's ah, very interesting. Okay. Any so, like, any to, any reason like any suspect? I don't know. I, not from what I recall. Not from what I recall. That's but fascinating. I do know that because in drug trials, you have to correct against it. Yeah, yeah. So you yeah. have to know like what percentage of it is likely to be perceived. And the percentage appears to be increasing, basically. Mm. So people are getting better at this. Maybe people are getting better at using their imaginations to heal themselves. Do you think it has anything to do with that idea of morphic resonance? Maybe. Maybe it does. I That's mean, it, maybe it's to do with... Maybe it's also to do with the fact that people... Um, Maybe people are deliberately using this effect as well. Maybe uh, it's not even consciously being used. Mm. But so coming it, back you know, to I, coming back to the idea of magic, though, is that how is that like? Um, how is that you? How is that utilized through magic, though, or, or through the imagination? Is it so? It's it's by fo it seems to be like by focusing uh, in on. I'm keep. I feel like this word intention's been used quite a lot lately, but. I'm just going to say like there's a focus point um, that you've with purpose gone into. I just saw a little, little mouse run past. That's interesting. Yeah. Like this, this focus point <laughs> here, I am getting distracted. Um, like the little mouse. <laughs> yeah. I kind of lost my, lost my train of thought there, but yeah, just how is that? How does it link up to magic? And it makes me think of the idea of casting a spell, you know, so, so I have, I have my intention. My intention is I want to get more money yeah. and then I have a technique that I deploy a skill. That's which, right. Mm. A skill that could be, could be described in psychological terms, or, um, if I'm doing something that is from another kind of a tradition or context, it might be something that, um, uh, you know, can be describable in lots of different kinds of forms of language. Um, but that intention, which is filtered through the skill, and the skill is generally one that invokes a combination of the body and the imagination. It's usually those things, will, well, I mean, you can't, it would seem, have one without the other, perhaps. Mm. Um, so it involves the imagination and that that is what leads to then the, uh, the outcome in the world. Now, that's a very kind of linear way of looking at it. It's a very, what sometimes people call like results magic way of looking at it. And it's a very psychological way of looking at it. So the things to bear in mind are these. Firstly, we do not know what the limits of the imagination are. We don't quite understand how, frankly, anything in the universe is, is related to each other. But we do know, it would seem, that many things are connected through subtle and strange processes. You know, even in terms of the emergent field of stuff like I don't know, quantum biology, take an example. You know, we've just suddenly discovered that there's a whole new layer in the way that biological systems operate, which is you know, way within conventional science, you know, the way that... Um, photosynthesis operates and so on and yeah. magic is predicated on the idea that everything is intimately connected with everything else so firstly we don't know where the limits of the imagination are so what we think of as like psychology we go yeah yeah but that's just psychology it's like well yeah that's psychology but there's a whole bunch of other slightly weirder stuff just a couple of phase shifts over from that where techniques appear to have effects on systems in the world individuals in the world situations in the world which are not as easily described as psychology yeah so that's one of the things that we really have to bear in mind the other thing we have to bear in mind is who is it who wants money in the first place by which i mean the self who we are that arises into the self that goes do you know what i need more money that self also emerges out of the whole world so it's not like we're isolated and we just do a thing and then it has an effect. It's not as simple as that. It's like we're in a network of processes and, a, and an intention it emerges through that network. And then if we can actualize that intention through a skill involving the imagination, it will feed back into the universe. And of course, it can feed back in any number of different ways. It could either work or not work, or it could work in exactly the opposite way to the way we work it, we wanted. Or it could work in a very, very different way. And then two years later, we realize, actually, do you know, that was incredibly helpful. So the thing I think about is just a, a tree, the idea of a tree growing and then like a branch coming out. It seems like we're almost that branch. And then we, we're, you know, gathering light 
through photosynthesis and the leaves that come off us, and then we're feeding that back into the tree, but there's this kind of reciprocal process. This, this is one of the paradoxes that you often get, or one of the, the problems that I think often emerges when you talk about like results magic, like casting spells and stuff, is that you know, people, people like in uh, Austin Osmond Spare's stuff and some of Pete Carroll's work, you start by like writing down your desire. And I always think, who is the person who writes this desire? Like who, where's that come from? You know, most of who most of who I am as a piece of biology is the microflora and fauna in my gut. Mm. It's not even the cell that that got my DNA in. Mm. So one of the things that magic does, I think, is it also then involves the effect happens in the world, and that reflects back on the self, and that's a process of then, you know, it's like that thing about um, listening to the feedback that you get from, from through anything really, but re recognizing that that process of kind of self-creation isn't just a process of like uh, acquiring resources or objects. It's a process of feeding intention to the universe and that those intentions will inevitably then affect and arise back as the next intention. Mm, this is you the know, part, so this is the part I wanted to ask you about actually. And this is the part of the, of magic I'm not so sure about. And, and, and it's the idea of kind of willing something out there into the world as opposed to, um, you know, floating downstream and letting the river take you and, yeah. and this kind of, yeah, like, and that not only the balance between those, but just looking at those two ideas of kind of, yeah, like, I don't know. And it seems, seems to me with magic, there's this, there's this sense of, okay, like you said, you know, write down the desire, this sense of kind of, hmm. I don't know if it's force or if it's. Uh, it's something you could call intention again, but I don't know, or somewhere in between. I, I think maybe it's like maybe it's like just the idea of you know you've got a project to do, um, but uh, and you you can control certain variables, but not others, and that's where you use like the skill, the magic to kind of get this thing done. So let's imagine you've got a boat and you want to go from one place to another, and the wind isn't blowing the right direction to mm. just carry you straight to the shore. Mm. So you have to tack. So you have to like move your boat in these zigzagging kind of motions through the wind in order to get there. So what you're doing is you're using a technique, you're using a process which skillfully utilizes the flow of the universe, the wind, doesn't doesn't seek to control it because it can't, frankly. It just hurts. That's crazy talk, you know. Um, you have to make sure that you're doing this in the right uh, the right time. So you, you might want to, in, in in a broad sense. So you need to be uh, the tide's got to be right. Mm. Yeah. So you, the moment of setting the intention out, um, and that, when I mean the right time, I don't necessarily mean like a certain phase of the moon, although that might be an, a, a thing. But you got to time it like right. The, yeah. The, the, the Timing's a big thing. Moment. Yeah. Yeah. And so what you're doing, I guess, is with, with magic is like you're saying, I think this is where I want to go. You know, I think that that's the shore that I want to travel to yeah. as far as I can tell from over here yeah. when I'm not. That's sure. exactly what I was going to say. It's, a, it's like about being open to landing on a different island and then going from there. Yeah, totally. And you might you might go, oh, my God, I've landed on this island now. That's a real problem. That sets up a whole bunch of other stuff, you know, or you might go, oh, or this is I didn't expect this. Or to I'm be just going to kind of live here for a bit and, you know, have some coconuts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah of course. Of course. Yeah. Of course. So we don't know what, you know, it's like that, there's that lovely uh, film and book Cloud Atlas, which has like this repeating set of motifs within it. Mm. And, and there's a it's a beautiful, um, uh, a beautiful piece of, uh, of, of art because it kind of shows how this kind of spiraling iterative process happens and how we can never really know what the outcome of any of our stuff is. Yeah. You know, but I mean, the skills are still course. useful when you're out and see, you know, out to sea. It's still, yeah, still useful course. to have those with you. Yeah. It's nice. Yeah. That's beautiful. Mm. Yeah, man. All right. I think this might be a good place to wrap things up unless there's anything else you wanted to explore, but you know, I really want to, I really want to try Tai Chi one day. I feel like it would be, I saw someone the other day at the park doing it. I see a lot of old men at parks doing Tai Chi and it just seems like a good time. Like <laughs> that looks so chill. Um, and it creates, one of the ones. An, creates an energy Sorry. in me walking past, you know, just kind of observing that. Yeah, man, it, it, is, it is really, really nice. I hear that because it's like, and I'm getting more into it. Like as I get older, basically, like the yoga that I do is like a Stanga yoga. So it's mm. like fast, stretchy and blah. And like when you're like, 20 
that's cool. 30, that's all right. And like 40, it starts to Have you tried Kundalini like, before? Have you have you done that as a preparation? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. I like I like, I like Kundalini yoga. It's 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 it's, 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 it's such a it's in many respects a very different style, but it's quite fun. But with Tai, but tai Chi. Tai Chi is great. Yeah. It's just because and, and also the thing about it is it's like the way that I understand it, the yeah. way that I've been uh, I've learned it, it's like uh, whereas yoga and again, this is the styles that I'm, I'm yeah, yeah. very m- most familiar with. Yoga is like, for me, is a lot more uh, hot, yang, pushing outwards, extension. Mm. Whereas Tai Chi has got a bit more of a yin style with it, with the ways that I do it. And I know that there's yin styles or softer styles of yoga practice and so on, and more martial styles of like Kung Fu and, and that kind of thing. But I like having, it basically in the summer, I like doing yoga. And in the wintertime, I like doing Tai Chi. And like I said, it means I don't have to put my uh, mat down on the ground because it's, I think there's a little bit of frost out there still. I don't know. Yeah. Mm. Anyway, see. That sounds awesome. Yeah. I've been getting, this is going to sound really unrelated, but I've been getting into drumming lately. And this idea of just kind of, I don't know. It's just like every activity you do that brings you back to this state of presence, whatever it might be, whether it's kicking around a, a footy or, or kind of play, playing a sport of some sort. Um, or, you know, drumming or, or Tai Chi or meditation, everything's got its own little flavor. And then obviously you've got all the different spectrum of it, the ways you can partake in that experience within that, um, you know, range, like you said, that certain modality of Tai Chi, a certain modality of yoga with a certain energy. And it's, yeah, I like, I just keep coming back to this idea of mixing them together and, and seeing what comes out. And even like what you said about, you know, the thing that interests you about the new ceremonies, you know, ceremonies that might not have such a lineage and kind of remixing old elements together. Cause that's what it seems like. That's what creativity is, right? You're just remixing other elements that have already existed in a, in a different way. Um, anyways, yeah. Enjoy Tai Chi. I'm going to give it a try sometime. Um, do it, man. I mean, YouTube is your friend. Go and find some, like, basically if you went to a class you would be copying some dude at the front, right? Yeah, it's the same so thing with like, yoga. Yeah. You know, it's, why not? Start there, like, and then just listen to your body. Like, your body will teach you, like, when you get, I mean, I did uh, the Chen Man Ching short form for, like, I don't know, about four or five years and got reasonably good at it and then managed to not do it long enough to forget it. Um, but once you've kind of got the flow, you can sort of think, ah, oh, yeah, I can see why this goes here. You, know, mm. you can... Because the body teaches you, you know, the body, the body has its message. Yeah. And now I'm thinking about uh, this conversation can keep going on. So I'm going to have to cut it off soon. But now I'm thinking about <laughs> ecstatic dance. I tried that recently for the first time. And that was a, a real, that was real yeah, fun. That's cool. Yeah. 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 Um, okay. And you've got, you've got, you've got Gabriel Roth's uh, five rhythms thing. That's really good as well. Okay. I'll check that like out. Yeah. There's plenty of stuff you've, you've kind of shared for me to um, check out and, it's going to mean a bit more work with the show notes, but appreciate all of that and everything will be available. Um, could you maybe, this is kind of a standard way to finish things, but um, I think it's a, a good one. Is there is there any way you could share um, some information on how people could get in touch, how they, you know, what books you have out, um, anything you want people to check out? I don't know if there is anything, but I know you've got that um, YouTube show come that comes out regularly, the my magical thing, yeah. which seems like a lot of play, playful fun. Um, yeah. Tell us where we can reach you and tell us, you know, what, what, what's going on at the moment in terms of projects and stuff that you want to share. Cool. Thank you. Well, um, the easiest place to get me at the moment is uh, the blog of Baphomet.com, which I've been running since about 2011, something like this. Um, and that has got kind of links to, like I've got an online teaching site that's being developed. Um, it's got links to uh, some of the My Magical Things series, which I think is just youtube.com forward slash deep magic begins here. Um, and then a lot of the recent stuff that I've published is on Psychedelic Press, psychedelicpress.co.uk. And um, the most recent publication is uh, a lecture that I was due to give to some students in Oxford University and then I was banned from speaking at the university. Um, I've got to check that uh, one out. Because, yeah, it's really, it's a hilarious story. Uh, so I think I've, uh, I've got a, I've got a cop- copy of it lurking around there. There you go. Um, 
so so yeah that's that's all, all on psychedelic press along with like getting higher and then a lot of the other books uh you know the mandrake press some of them are only available through amazon i'm afraid so you know jeff gets yet more money um but yeah you can you can find me facebook for friendly and nice people you know reach out yeah that sounds Kate. awesome okay yeah this sounds cool i'm definitely going to check out that band lecture it sounds interesting um but yeah i really, really just wanted to share my gratitude with you julian thanks for saying yes to this sorry about all the hassles in getting connected in the beginning but i appreciate your presence here with me and and um yeah this has been you know a special one michael thank you so much for inviting me it's really appreciated and thank you for like yeah holding the space pushing the levers getting the wires working and um helping helping us to unfold the conversation it's a real real pleasure my friend i really hope that you've found this conversation to be invigorating and to be useful in some way and you've connected with some of these thoughts and ideas that we've shared if you have then consider sharing them with a friend and consider subscribing if you haven't already uh, if you want to find out more about julian there'll be links to i'm going to attempt to put links to everything we spoke about in the description section or the show notes section uh, you can visit todaydreamer.com it might be up there i'm going to endeavor to kind of fix the website up it's it's been a bit of a, a problem um i don't want to say problem child but it's been a bit of a struggle uh to kind of get that under wraps anyways um thank you for listening there'll be some information on everything we've spoken about and yeah i look forward to catching you in the next episode and hearing from you possibly um, with feedback if you feel like it get in touch uh, but until next time be well <laughs>